Um, all right. Great. Well, my name is Carl Alves. I uh, hail from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, I live in Dartmouth, uh, Massachusetts, which is the next town over. Uh, we're about an hour outside of Boston. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this work for, for quite some time and run into some, some challenges. I've run coalitions. I've started them. I've been, you know, I'll give you a little bit of my background in terms of how I got involved with this. Um, but I kind of want to just take a look, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat. Um, you know, if you could just jot down uh, what constituency do you mainly serve? Would you, or do you represent rural, suburban, or uh, rural, suburban, or urban areas of uh, yeah, constituency? I understand that you might be from a lot of different kinds of places. Very rural, okay, suburban, okay, urban. Great. We've got a lot of, uh, some diversity in the group here. So, uh, which is always really interesting because, you know, my background is in urban and suburban. So I'm always very interested in hearing the challenges of folks that are, are rural. Uh, we were doing a, um, a recent program uh, for the DEA down in Miami. And I, uh, you know, just an hour, <clears throat> we were gonna drive to the other part of the state to go um, stay, uh, do some other work. And so we were down in Miami about an hour, hour and a half out of the city, all of a sudden get, came into this rural area. And now my concept of rural is, okay, in Massachusetts, everything's kind of compact. Uh, so our farming area is probably maybe 30, 30 minutes outside of our urban area. Um, but when you get to larger states like North Carolina or Wisconsin or Florida, um, the farms and the, the, the rural communities go for hours and hours and hours. So uh, my heart goes to all the folks in rural um, country USA because uh, – it is tough to kind of keep it all together. Um, and then sometimes folks that are in, in urban and suburban also have uh, different perspectives. Today, we're really gonna be talking about, you know, the connection between prevention, intervention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. Um, I have a little bit of experience uh, in all of those areas. And it's interesting because as a person that kind of came to this business, uh, because I was looking for help for somebody, um, it was interesting to kind of see the navigation and my own personal evolution uh, as, as we do this work. If you could, everybody just take a minute and just jot in the chat uh, what part of the solution you represent. Do you mostly represent prevention? Intervention, treatment, recovery. Okay, so pretty safe to say. Oh, well, you got an intervention in there. That's good. Uh, a couple of treatments. Terrific. Thank you for sharing that. But it, it, this is a prevention heavy group, which you know, as the name suggests, of course, that's where that's where we go. But it's good to to hear uh, from folks from the intervention and treatment and, and recovery. I don't see a ton of recovery folks uh, in this room, uh, but that is one of those areas that I think uh, we as preventionists want to uh, be aware of and connect with. And you know, there's in SAMHSA. Um, you know, has those de delineations. And so sometimes it's difficult because, you know, recovery is not necessarily considered primary prevention, but maybe it's tertiary uh, prevention, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that. Um, and in, in it's it's interesting, I just saw the, you know, sidelined by funding sources. And that that's unfortunately how we all, we're all kind of in our little silos. And, but when we're building coalitions, uh, they're funding us to make sure that we're including the entire community. Uh, but sometimes they uh, will uh, kind of handcuff 
handcuff us to certain rules that kind of limit our ability. But we want to talk a little bit about that, share some of those uh, frustrations, but also hopes and strategies to kind of overcome uh, the challenges that we face, you know, doing this work. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, next question, and there's not a ton of these, but just to get a feel for who's in the room, uh, folks that have done, you know, uh, less than three, four to 10, uh, 11 to 20 or too long to remember. Could you just jot your length of uh, time working in this in this field or doing the, what you've been doing? If you put that in the chat, that'd be helpful. Looks like, well, 20, 11 to 20, looks like we're seeing a little bit of everything, Carl. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah, from six months to 20 years. There we go, great. And so, you know, why is it important for us to, have folks that are, um, you know, at that 20 year mark, and why is it important that we have some people that are uh, in the four to 10 or the zero to three? Anybody uh, suggestions for that of why, uh, why that would be important? Different perspectives, absolutely. I mean, I, I think different perspectives is where we're trying to do mentoring, great. Fresh blood, yes. Experience, uh, know how to open to new ideas, and that and then that's the challenge. It's been my experience, been doing this for you know quite some time. Uh, it's it's really key and important to understand the technology ch uh, changes, and you know to be relevant and to stay connected and not think that Facebook is the best social media to reach young people at, you know, those kinds of things to remain uh, relevant in those different perspectives. But we also want to, you know, the, for some of the OGs in the room, you know, the, the life experience, institutional knowledge, relationships, they can help bring up somebody that might be new to the uh, new to the business. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes um, there is a rub between both of those. And so navigating some of those differences um, and, and fostering a culture of inclusion is really important. And we'll talk about this. I'm sure you might have seen this um, graphic uh, once or twice before, uh, the beautiful spiff flower. Uh, we're really going to be focused on capacity building. Uh, and to me, capacity building talks about sustainability uh, because capacity building is not a, a beginning and end. It is something that is continuous and dynamic uh, because circumstances change, partnerships change, relationships change. Um, and it, it, that is what, if you keep an eye on capacity building, um, you know, as an important piece you'll you'll address the sustainability and cultural competence out of necessity uh because just the three polls that we talked about you know we're heavy on prevention we don't have a lot in this room from treatment or recovery um and why is that well people aren't thinking about that they're on their gerbil, gerbil wheel or working on their silo but at us as preventionists and coalition builders, uh, we need to kind of draw in some of these folks so that they can begin to understand the larger picture beyond their own particular silo. And once they do, they find out, oh, well, this isn't so bad and this is how we can uh, work together. So today's focus is really gonna be on uh, building capacity, uh, but you know, with a mind's eye to assessment, because you always have to have the good data and understand what it is that you're trying to do first uh, before you can do it. A solid plan is obviously important uh, because just having ideas uh, won't get the job done. Implementation and, of course, evaluation, that's always a, uh, an important tool. Um, we know about the 12 sectors. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that all of those uh, aspects are addressed within um, coalitions and, you know, the, the, the groups that you're working with, I don't need to re reiterate that. Um, but these are the kinds of things and the sectors that SAMHSA really wants us to have when we're building coalition, where it's for drug free communities or, uh, in general coalitions to do any of the work, because all of the funding sources, uh, coming from the federal government are coming in suggesting and requiring 
partnerships and collaborations and how we do that effectively will be how our project goes. What I want to talk about today specifically is, you know, we've seen this uh, wheel of the continuum uh, of the work that, that we do from promotion to prevention, which includes universal selective indicated and then treatment, uh, which is more focused on identification of cases and, and, and standards of care. Uh, and then recovery is the, the longer term, you know, aftercare, you know, that sort of thing. Sometimes recovery and treatment get, kind of get meshed together. Um, and it's all, uh, but it's all kind of important. And we want to talk about those little gaps that you see between the, the arrow points at the top of the, the arc there, uh, where promotion turns into prevention, where prevention turns into treatment. And uh, there's that gap. And we want to try to fill those little gaps. Um, so I, we're talking about capacity building and we're talking about the gaps between prevention, treatment, recovery, um, specifically, and what can we do to kind of foster, uh, better relations between those parts of this continuum and, you know, understanding that resources are, 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 are challenging and, and funders want specific things, but we've got to make the case that, um, all of these elements are important and they all have a role in each other's work. And the better we can understand that, the better as a continuum we'll be able to serve the people that we're trying to serve. Fair enough? So collaboration, capacity building is what we're talking about. Why are we here? Um, you know, we've got a lot of different stories why we get into this field. More often than not, we've been touched by uh, addiction, whether it be our own addiction or that of a loved one. Uh, I'm no different. My bag, and I'm not showing this picture just to show off my 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 old uh, mustache. But uh, why why am I here? This is a picture of uh, of my um, wife, my first wife. I, I have since remarried, um, and she is a. We had a wonderful uh, life together. I uh, had come to the agency back in the early '90s to. Um, get help for somebody, a friend of mine. And um, I was captivated by this agency because they, they, wanted, to, they wanted to help me and they, they were open, um, they were welcoming, uh, and they didn't ask much of me. They were just here for me. And my background was in finance, and which was far more transactional in nature. Uh, so I, it, it kind of threw me off. Uh, I was so captivated, the, the person I was trying to help went on their own path, um, but I was captivated because, you know, so, oh, these people were kind. This was uh, something that was was important to me. It was so much so that I ended up making a career change, and I've been here at this agency. It's uh, called Positive Action Against Chemical Addiction uh, since the early 90s, and, you know, I've had a variety of different experiences. We're a grassroots organization. We provide support. Uh, we've got some housing programs, employment programs, uh, access to treatment programs, outreach programs. We do interventions. We have some youth uh, services as well. Um, but what I was so captivated by was just one person helping another. And it was a mixed bag of different kinds of folks that were uh, were part of this. People early in recovery, people with extensive recovery, people like me who... Um, were you know you know touched by it and you know uh, came from a family uh, perspective to try to do what I could to try to address this. Now this was at the beginning of the 90s, and so HIV/AIDS was a big issue at that time, uh, and so we were seeing a lot of you know di you know folks um, that were contracting HIV were also IV drug users at the time, so there was a heavy connection between that. So, but anyways, I, I, I got involved, uh, met my wife, uh, who was in recovery, um, and, you know, had 10 wonderful years of life until which point, um, there was a point in time where she had some, some medical issues and unfortunately kind of turned back to some, some sleep meds, which led to painkillers, which led to you know, uh, a return to dependency, which led to, um, you know, addiction, 18 different 
detoxes uh, during that time until one point where we had to kind of uh, end our marriage. Um, and sadly, uh, she passed. She passed um, from complications of her own personal um, uh, substance use. And so this has been part of my drive over the years to try to kind of bring this forward. So, I, you know, I'm coming from a, a recovery standpoint. Um, my early years at PACA, I was, you know, they wanted me to be on the coalition. So I served on the coalition. Back then, in the, in the 90s, there were like gobs and gobs of money. Uh, and, you know, it was like a half a million dollars as opposed to the hundred thousands that they're giving uh, now. But it was kind of an experimental kind of thing. And we, I, they wanted me to be on this coalition. And I was part of the coalition um, representing my the, the organization. I, I made the transition away from business into the nonprofit. And I served, a, I was on the board. Then I served as the exec, executive director ever since. But I, on this coalition board, I was a volunteer. I was new. I didn't didn't have full training. I wasn't trained as a, a drug counselor yet. I was, you know, doing uh, some of that schoolwork, all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, I had some business uh, background, so they, they wanted me. I was willing. I was interested in that sort of thing. You fast forward four or five years, lots of, you know, we had probably a staff of eight and nine folks. Um, and, you know, things were going well. And then the funding stopped. And, you know, so then people had, you know, we couldn't afford to keep the people anymore. Uh, didn't do a good enough job in terms of addressing sustainability and, you know, that sort of thing. We had some great projects that, you know, some of those projects were able to kind of maintain, but certainly not at the same level. Um, and so it was just me and a group of volunteers uh, that, you know, were left after this and we say, hey, we can't just stop this. Uh, so we ended up creating a 501c3 and carrying on at a much lesser extent, but probably a deeper extent, that coalition. And so that's kind of what drives me uh, and my experience. So seeing, uh, you know, through the lens of recovery, the importance of, you know, helping people move on, feeling the loss of somebody in recovery, also doing uh, prevention and uh, trying to, connect the dots, those little gaps, they're trying to connect the dots. Whereas, gee, why can't we have people in recovery be part of this? Well, there are risks with it. We'll talk about some of the challenges uh, that maybe we face with some of that. But that's, that's why I'm here. I encourage you to do self-reflection and understand why you're here. Understanding your why, why you're doing the work that you're doing, um, you know, being able to tell your story and uh, sharing that and being open uh, with people will draw more people into the work that you do. Um, and, you know, some people don't feel comfortable with that, and that's absolutely fine. But it really is important if we're going to be successful practitioners that we have to reflect on the work that we're doing. It is not enough to, you know, have the, the data analytics and, you know, the checkoff boxes of all the folks that are, uh, you know, the capacity driven uh, and, and, and all the paperwork without understanding the humanity about that. And I think sometimes as preventionists, we forget that humanity. And uh, so I encourage us to kind of expand that, uh, expand that, that view and start with ourselves. Um, a lot of folks like myself came into this business, business accidentally. We were looking for help and then all of a sudden, hey, you know, we're here. This is something that's important. There are a lot of families who have, especially during the opioid crisis of the last 20, 30 years, you know, have lost loved ones and are full of passion and brought a lot of great things to the table. However, uh, sometimes, especially people new, might not necessarily have the, the boundaries that uh, perhaps are required to get some of this work done. So I, I'm a big fan of self-reflection, spending that time in coalition work where possible. Yes, it's, it's touchy-feely sometimes, and sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. But if we are expecting people to come to us to change their behaviors, to prevent substance use, to 
trust us to intervene or provide some some guidance and, and referral for a better uh, better way of life or access treatment or remain in treatment and or uh, a life of recovery, it's all built on trust. And um, building that trust is really job one. And that's really the capacity building because life changes, uh, relationships change. That's why self infection. So I'm gonna ask a question. Here is a picture of a brain. And in terms of the self reflection, um, left side brain folks are more on the analytical side, logical, precise, repetitive, organized, detailed, oriented. We're all, you know, we have two sides to our brains. So it's very rare that this one, you know, the, you know, it's either or, it's usually a blend of both. But if you had to pick a majority for yourself, uh, how many would say, you put it in your chat, are you left more left-brained or right brain, more creative, imaginative, general, conceptual, uh, empathetic, those kinds of things, irregular. Um, I, and I'm thinking irregular means not, uh, I mean, <laughs> the thought process. Anyway, uh, if you put in the chat, what do you tend to be? Seeing a lot of, a lot of right brains, right for sure. Okay. Well, we, there's a couple lefts. There we go. So as we're probably skewing a little bit more um, to the right uh, with this particular group. Um, and, you know, and I think, although, you know, we're seeing uh, – just goes through this so I can see everybody's. More right, yeah. Understanding where you're at and understanding the rest of your coalition or your teammates or your groups uh, where they where they stand. It's not meant to be a you know scientific assessment, but it's a general feel for where people are, that self-reflection, understanding, hey, I tend to be a little bit more, you know, I've got both sides, and sometimes I like to be, especially when I'm under pressure, you know, organized, detailed, that sort of thing, but my real comfort zone and where I feel the best about myself is when I'm feeling uh, creative, imaginative, you know, th those those kinds of things. So, yes, you have to be on both sides, but it's important. And, and as you do your work, you develop your work plans, as you build your capacity, you want to keep an eye out so that, you know, you've got a nice blend of left and right brain folks and activities and structure and procedure and policy that kind of meets the needs of those, uh, those kinds of folks. So if we look at the five general personality traits, openness, conscientiousness, um, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Those are the five general, and again, just like left brain, left right brain, it, nobody's all one or the other. It's usually somewhere in the middle. Uh, but again, as you're building your teams, you want to, you know, have a blend of different types of folks, folks that are open. But if you, I don't know if anybody of you have uh, been part of a group where everybody in the group is open, does much get done? <laughs> no, because they have people are thinking, you know, 80 million different ideas and, uh, you know, and it's great. It might feel fun to have lively conversations. However, um, a, a group of all open people uh, might sound good, but it's not as effective and it's probably not going to serve your community as well. Conscientiousness. You know, I've also been group where there's a majority of people that are highly conscientious and they tend, you know, they tend to be evaluators. No offense to evaluators out there. I love you. I've learned to love you over time. Uh, but, you know, it, it's sometimes uh, people that are living by the by the letter of the law um, and that are, are, are checking boxes lose some of the openness folks and people don't want to pay attention. Uh, but if without the conscientious people, you're not going to get repeated funding. Uh, so there is a, an essential role uh, for the conscientious 
uh, folks that are, uh, you know, working towards, you know, specific goals within the within the lines, within the parameters and policies. Uh, extroversion, you know, we know our extroverts in our group having a good time. People love them. It's all, all fun and games. Um, however, if it's a, a group of all extroverts, well, you know, <laughs> fighting for attention, getting things done, trying to focus can be difficult. But that extrovert that can draw people to the table, uh, that can make, that can um, cover and help with difficult conversations uh, can be one of the, the best assets that you have in your group. And then agreeableness. Um, you know, a lot of us are there. We want to help people. We want to agree and try to be peacemakers, no conflict. And the challenge with that is that if everybody's thinking the same way and everybody's agreeing with that, and maybe you have some groups where everybody, you know, is like-minded the same way, you know, the same perspective and is in agreement all the time, that's not as, that's not necessarily great either. You don't want to be in, on the opposite where everybody's disagreeable, uh, but having that balance is important. So again, something in terms of, uh, you know, looking at some of these personality traits, your own, start with your own, uh, and then really kind of map out within your group. And then neuroticism. Now, certainly the folks that believe that the sky is falling 100% of the time can be tiring and it can be difficult. If it's tiring for us, you can only imagine what it is for them. Uh, however, the folks that are uh, kind of glass half empty folks are really great to have on your team as well. Uh, because they can be a check and balance to the open person that thinks everything's great and we should do everything. Um, so again, this is all about balance and that. So something to think about uh, in terms of the makeup of your organizations, of what you're trying to do, and um, you know, keep that in mind. Because everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. And quite frankly, all of this work all of this work with, with addiction, behavioral um, health is about understanding what irritates us, understanding our, you know, our self-awareness so that we can improve and make change where we can uh, to make life better for ourselves as well as for those that we serve um, because it's, it really is, uh, that's at the crux of what we're trying to work. So. Capacity building. So that's my preface for um, something that each one of you is, as your members leading or, you know, guiding a uh, coalition, you know, really start with yourself and then I'll make it easier for you to kind of understand and your own strengths and weaknesses uh, so that, you know, because no one person is everything to everyone. So any questions at this point? So we'll just keep moving along. What is capacity? Types of levels of resources available to maintain. And I'm, I'm using opioid, but it's it's any prevention system. Uh, you know, again, what are some of the the big capacity issues that you face in your work? Can you put that in the chat for me? Or you can unmute and speak up if you'd like to. If you want to unmute, um, just use the raise your hand function at the bottom and I can go and I can unmute you. Or you can feel free to use the, the chat feature as well. Both there. I was told that some of you might like to talk. Some people prefer the chat. Either one's fine. Uh, I, I do like to hear voices and perspectives. Um, and Carl, it looks like we have um, a Crystal who has her hand raised. So Crystal, I'm going to unmute you. Sounds good. All right, Crystal, you are you have the floor. Crystal, what's your big challenge? And is she muted? She's unmuted, but it looks like she's calling in, so I'm not sure uh, if there's something different. Okay. Crystal, can you try and Say something. 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, not, not hearing not, anything. All right, not, not a problem. Okay. How about somebody else? <laughs> so others are. They're saying in the chat we've got staffing, counselor turnover rate, community readiness. Staffing is a huge issue these days. Yeah. It really is, and you know the the. Um, but the, but there are opportunities out there, uh, you know, and I, I think, again, it is there are a lot of people that are um, don't know that they're preventionists or recovery specialists uh, or treatment advocates uh, that they know yet. I, and I think a lot of times what we we as coalitions, um, you know, we're so focused on our work plan that we forget building infrastructure uh, and that infrastructure the lives that we're touching uh, the, the, you know uh, indirectly through the work that we do and, and people um, you know one of my big things that I try to do um, in my community is bring people together in coalitions and task forces uh, on specific or related issues um, one of the things because it, there's so many competing interests because the way the funding structures work for a lot of this work is that we're competing against one another to for grant funding for um, personnel uh, mm -hmm. you know people are just you know grabbing from uh, each other you know do, you know raising you know the dollar fee and we're not making the pie bigger we're just trying to look at our slice of the pie um, and so wherever possible, and I'm kind of in a unique position because we are a small organization, but we connect to so many of them that we, I've had some good success bringing people together to kind of talk about ideas on a building capacity. So I, I established this one group that was called the Mental Health Providers Network. And there were two, we talked about what is it that we can all work on together um, that you know, it's not necessarily about a program per se, but we're all struggling with workforce development and we're all struggling with self-care. And those were two big um, areas that, you know, it was good for us to kind of come together. Uh, do you have those kinds of things? Um, you know, how do you, how do you come together and do self-care in, in your community? Anybody have any uh, any thoughts on that? Anything that they're pr proud of or they'd like to share? Because I'll, I'll I'll tell you one of the things that I was very happy about, uh, and then we've done it now for about five years. We call it Heal the Healers, uh, and it is a day for providers, for first responders, for clinicians and social workers. Um, mm -hmm. Really, no, you know, anybody's welcome that's like-minded, uh, that that cares for others, that wants to participate, and we were able to have such a great response because everybody's kind of struggling with that. Um, where we would have, uh, you know, providers come together, and it would be a day-long program. We would offer CEUs for some workshops on self-care. Uh, we brought in uh, massage therapists, and Reiki folks, and and other crystals and, you know, a, a variety of holistic kinds of uh, vendors and that sort of thing, and really made a day for caregivers. Um, and it's been something that uh, people look forward to. Um, and it's a nice reminder that we need to fill our cup. Now we have in my community, probably 10 or 15 different providers that, that part, participate directly. They send their staff. Uh, and that as well as first responders, because sometimes the first responders and the social workers don't necessarily interface other than perhaps a, a referral or two or that, that kind of stuff. This was an opportunity for us to do some really capacity building. And it was something that we offered. Now, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily drug prevention. However, it is about bringing community. It's about building relationships. Uh, it's helping people understand their, uh, become more self-aware uh, and understand their strengths and, and, and challenges. Um, and it's been something that has been um, a really good capacity building in addition to networking and all of those kinds of things, which are, which are, are really important. 
what is your coalition? What are you, what are you doing as you know the groups that you're involved in to make your community at large better, as opposed yeah. to just specifically a program? Was there a question, Connor? Right. Well, Diana agreed with you that counselors need counseling too. Yes. Um, and Tarasha talks about bringing youth serving agencies together, and one of their goals is self care. And the first event is yoga and meditation. Which is fantastic. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. And I mean, and, the, and that is the kind of thing. I mean, one back in my early prevention days, one of our biggest strengths, and I we've kind of gotten away from it a little bit. I don't know why, maybe because the world has changed, but we had so many peer leadership groups. I mean, it was like peer, I mean, that was like the thing. We had tons of them everywhere. And uh, we would bring these young people to conferences and uh, really build our workforce of the future by connecting, training these young people into, you know, uh, to become more self-aware, to understand the resources, uh, to be more peer leaders for their friends and families. Um, and that was very strong. Unfortunately, it's dissipated a little bit uh, because it takes a lot of work. There's not tons of funding for this, uh, but it is, that was one of those things that came out of drug-free communities that I know for our community, I'd love to see more of that, where there was a, a youth uh, group connected to all of the different projects and uh, we're doing. I think we've, as a society, um, kind of shifted into a treatment focused society and it, it's become much more transactional. Uh, and unfortunately, I think one of the un, uh, unintended consequences is we've created more of a dependency on treatment um, and there are better options now. There's better uh, treatment availability um, and we know more, we know how to address things better. But I think, especially with the onset of, you know, the phones and um, that sort of thing, I think we've lost some of that relational um, support. And that's, you know, we're even seeing it in recovery communities. The, you know, the, you know, people were really craving to get back together in person for, you know, after the uh, pandemic in, in recovery communities for 12 step meetings and uh, mutual aid kinds of meetings and other kinds of supports. And it's been great, but people want things done for them. They're not taking the ball and running so in terms of building capacity creating a culture of service uh of of camaraderie of interagency collaboration this is the future uh nobody has enough money to do all of it um we we are required to put down our work plans and have our uh, smart goals and and those kinds of things i challenge all of you to kind of include capacity building in that work because that is what's truly going to be sustainable and that is what truly makes a difference. Uh, it's the ongoing relationship and, and community, uh, you know, that we build. Those partnerships, um, increasing community awareness, being accessible and available to the community, not dictating, oh, here is, you know, the shoulds, I'm not going to, you know, don't shoot on people, right? Um, we want to engage and have a strong relationship with the community at large, and it takes time. You're not going to be able to reduce substance use by 50% if you're not, don't have the hearts and minds of people um, that you're working with. And so those strengthening coalitions and, and capacity and humanizing this work, understanding that not everybody uh, has time to make an evening meeting or can't make a daytime meeting or might have child care issues or might have language issues or might have other barriers that, you know, they'd be interested in participating. So the more savvy we can be with, you know, telecommunication, with ongoing communication, with uh, a really strong communication strategy, um, the, the more effective we can be. But, you know, sending flyers, sending emails, all important stuff. But if that is your communication strategy, you're missing the boat. Uh, it's got to be deeper than that. And we've got to return to um, more, you know, more interaction and more deeper context 
and setting expectations, real, realistic expectations. One of the big things that, you know, uh, treatment folks, you know, struggle with is unrealistic expectations of the people that are sending referrals to get help. You know, the mom that comes and calls me and says, I need you to, to help my daughter get into a treatment plan, a treat, treatment program. And, you know, and I'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help. But my first question to the mom is, what are you doing for you to, you know, for yourself right now? How are you helping? There is a disconnect because I think people don't understand uh, the availability of treatment, what treatment is, uh, what recovery is. And that's what we need to do, and especially prevention is the t tip of the sword. We have the opportunity to kind of, you know, spend that dollar in prevention to save seven or more uh, in treatment. And and so we need to become marketing experts. Uh, we need to be community experts. And But being experts means mobilizing the people that are the centers of influence in the neighborhoods. Uh, it's not just because everybody knows our name or might know our logo or, you know, we've got this fantastic website. It's how are we connecting and mobilizing those resources? You know, Carl, um, in the chat, Camille just um, mentioned about the recovery cafe model that's growing across the country. Um, and it just sounds amazing with the center and community accountability, creativity, opportunity, and love being a huge shift in the right direction for the recovery community. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, oh, great. It is, there's a link there, too. I, I hesitate of clicking on the link because I don't want to, you know, do that. But, you know, again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Astrid, on this. You know, we oftentimes want to create a recovery community uh, when we really should be looking at creating a community of recovery. Everybody's recovering from something. Uh, and we've done some really great work to reduce stigma, uh, but it is difficult for a recovery community to kind of attend a fundraiser uh, for, you know, a cause because it usually involves, you know, wine tasting or open bar or something to that effect. And, you know, that is, those are, those are some of the challenges. What are the, have you, have you um, geomapped? the safe places and safe or, you know, uh, safe events where all folks are able to come. Not just people in recovery, but maybe people that are in recovery that are also LGBTQ or uh, folks that are undocumented or, you know, th that sort of thing. We need to recognize it and, and look at this in a broad brush as in our assess, you know, assessment process to kind of identify what gaps exist in our community. Uh, I'm part of the Rotary Club, um, and you know it, it's it's interesting to hear. I, I did it because you know one of the organizations I'm part of wanted to have representation on the Rotary, you know, and I was you know kind of accidentally you know pushed into that role. And I've been doing it now for you know a few years and enjoy it because it's very different, uh, and I like it because it gives me. A perspective people that really don't have i mean they they have some ideas about addiction and 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 homelessness and and the how you know the whole housing scarcity issue and uh food insecurity and that sort of thing but so many people are so insulated from the realities that many folks are, are feeling uh there is so much work to do and unfortunately unfortunately conditions are just getting worse uh, we're seeing more and more people migrating to our, our shores, our borders, um, because of the disarray in their own countries or, you know, climate change results, those kinds of things. And it's only going to continue to worsen. So coalitions work that uh, folks are doing has, has a broader impact. One of the things that we did to um, pivot uh, in the work that we did and although we had very specific smart goals for the projects and that sort of thing, but we have additional capacity. So we were able to kind of say, hey, food insecurity was a major issue for a lot of folks that were out of work. Uh, and so we were able to kind of mobilize our community and do food. Well, what does food have to do with prevention? Well, it's building relationship. We were able to kind of build 
uh, connections with people and say, hey, I know I've been meaning to talk to you. And, and we were able to gain uh, uh, volunteers. We we're able to kind of gain new pathways for communication uh, and that. But again, it requires to kind of stretch out because people aren't necessarily coming to prevention organizations uh, saying, we want to help you. Most of the time, it might be, you know, a treatment or the treatment focused person or somebody that just lost somebody to an overdose or suicide or, or, or something to that effect that wants to do something to kind of, you know, uh, in remembrance of the person that they lost. Uh, and it's very transactional and it's very focused on, you know, the, their own um, self care. And that's part of it. And you want to support that. However, that's not how you build. Uh, a sustainable process, um, and so we're, you know we're faced with with a lot of that. So again, um, we need to focus capacity building um, that will be most effective uh, in terms of the goals, community goals. Look outside of just your goals and see what others need. Part of the reason why we've been able to uh, survive is because we're we're focused on helping others solve their problems. We recognize that substance use disorder, uh, mental health, behavioral health related conditions impact all society in all different sectors. Um, and so it's important for us to be in those six sectors. Uh, it's a stretch sometimes, it's difficult, um, but it's important to have those relationships because those relationships as we build is the capacity that we're talking about uh, because it's really about who you know and who you can pick up the phone to and who is willing to listen to you. Somebody might not be able to come to a monthly meeting, but we'll take your call and then write a check or help you with, you know, uh, you know, food donation or help you, you know, get a permit or something to that effect. To me, those relationships are oftentimes much more important uh, than somebody that's going to sit in the meeting. We need them. We need it all. Uh, but, you know, uh, again, not everybody's as motivated as we are to do this. And people have to kind of uh, see, you know, what's in it for them. So uh, don't be a high-flying service silo. Again, I guess that's part of the point here is, that, you know, we're really talking about expanding uh, the powers in the partnership. It is in the relation, re relational um, opportunity to you know, I'm messing up my graphics here. Uh, you know, it, it really kind of build relationship. And we do that by going out and meeting people, um, going out to other people's meetings, not just expecting them to come to yours. Uh, it's about outside of meetings, spending some time, having a coffee, doing some young professional uh, gatherings, you know, after work or, you know, um, you know, some round table uh, conversations. We have a little lunch bunch. We get together uh, once a month just to kind of informal, uh, but but fun. It's sharing food, breaking bread, you know, that's important. Um, and that is the stuff that, that builds going for, you know, that. So we talked about networking. Um, and, you know, that's the, the most informal model, but in cooperation, uh, when you're working together um, on something that you have a shared um, vision, a shared goal, and uh, it's more than just talking and coordination, it's that next step where, okay, hey, this worked. How do we do it better? How do we continually improve on this? Uh, how do, who do we need to bring in? Um, and then the full collaboration where, it, you know, and, and sometimes integration where, you know, folks are really, you know, not only a memorandum of understanding, I'm sure many of you have experienced the, oh, sign this MOU so we can get this grant. And then, you know, that was the extent of it. Um, that's not what we're trying to do here. We're, we're trying to do something uh, deeper. And um, those are the different kinds. And then, you know, we've had uh, projects that we've started here that it grew to a point where they needed to go out on their own and become their own entity. And, you know, the very, we created this thing called uh, the Smiles Mentoring Program. And it, it got so big that, it, it, you know, we let it go. So some of the work that we do as preventionists is, is the um, so, social uh, social project 
incubator, uh, trying to see what works, helping things foster. But sometimes you have to let go of some of these things uh, to take a life of them, their own. And you never know what happens when you do that, and it might not make it, or it might make it terrifically. But, you know, a lot of times our society is focused on bigger, better, more, uh, and we might hang on to things that just might be um, something that we might need to let go and just support from uh, from afar. So I see a comment here. Somebody want to help me with that? About the cafe? I'm really talking more about the, uh, the recovery cafe model. So maybe we could take a couple minutes and, and would, would you like to, you know, chat a little bit more about that, Camille? Just uh, in the real time voice? Yeah, Camille, if you want to um, raise your hand, then I can I can unmute you or I can go in and find you. Let's see. There she okay. is. All right. All right. You're unmuted, Camille. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I stated in the chat, I'm the former director of the Recovery Cafe here in Indy. And when I say that I'm no longer there, but I still stand by the model 100% just because of what it you know, means and what it stands for. Um, some of the principles just of the cafe alone are, you know, to um, connect with love, practice forgiveness, you know, cultivate compassion, um, build community and collaboration. So it's really an approach that really meets those who are in recovery. And we say we're all recovering from right. anything. So, so that really reduces the stigma of what that looks like um in the community and we come together as a community with volunteers um with classes that's truly focused um the recovery on the recovery so your recovery looks like whatever that means to you so in, in the model um some of the key aspects are the cafe which is all about community building activities you have some sort of food some sort of snack maybe coffee um, there as well, because it is like a cafe um, and all these services are free. Um, each person participates in a recovery circle, which is just a recovery check in where you talk about what's going well in your recovery, what's not going well. Um, and where areas you see growth or movement, and then you set a goal or intention for the day and incorporates a 5 minutes of silence as a form of meditation. But it is um, completely disconnected from um, traditional methods, such as face based, but really inclusive. To, to all aspects and then um, they have a sober social events and also um, school for recovery, which are classes that you partner with the community, but also members who are um, in recovery use the, the peer approach, of course, um, to teach classes. So that can be classes on, you know, overcoming trauma or tools for mental health, or it can be cooking classes or, you know, just whatever the community. Pro social stuff, right? Yeah, whatever. Exactly, whatever yeah. the community sees as a need. And then getting those members also connected to the those uh, necessary resources, and like I said in the chat, what what I seen when I was the director was okay. We're 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 focusing on recoveries, but we also have the families, and we have you know the youth. So we had started having family friendly Fridays to create a multi generational approach um, to recovery. And then um, again, before I left, I launched the idea to um, our local state. Um, about having the youth cafe and just this week on Tuesday, we launched the 1st youth cafe and that's the 1st within the entire model. Because again, I was a, a child of 2 parents um, who um, were heavy in addiction. And so I was in the NA meetings with my mom, mm. you know, continuously and seeing the, you know, how that affects someone as a youth. So with this model, it, it really can serve as prevention and intervention for the entire, you know, family and creating opportunities for youth um, to discover themselves. That's what the cafe is called for the youth, the discovery cafe. So how can you find out who you are? How can you connect with the love of yourself? So then in turn, you can connect with the love of others in the community. And again, I'm very passionate about the model. <laughs> are you really? Um, that didn't come through at all. No, no. <laughs> Love I say it. that I'm like, you can hear it when I talk about it because <laughs> it is truly something that I've seen. That so, can I ask you a couple of questions? So just yes. about how did it get started and how many, how many different organizations are part of this? Or is this driven by one organization? No, so it, there, it, it started in Seattle, Washington um, 18 years ago. 
Um, and then they created a network in 2016. And now I believe there are, um, I think over, I think like 60 cafes across the country. And here in Indiana, an organization called We Bloom um, took on the cafe model, went through the training in Seattle and brought it here to the state of Indiana. And they have now become the, the catalyst for the Midwest. So if you are in the Midwest and you're looking to want to start a recovery cafe, it does take the community buy-in. I can say for Indy, um, we were grateful to be able to partner with the Division of Mental Health and Addictions here from our state. So uh, they highly funded um, this program and also helped to fund to get the others, other ones uh, started across the state of Indiana. But it's all about community partnerships because when you think about, you know, recovery and if we're building community for are the members is what we call individuals in the cafe. You also have to build community within the community. So having organizations come together and work together in order um, to get this started. So we started to develop a, a whole list of community partners. Again, from the food that we provided, you need a, you know a local maybe food bank to provide food, maybe a coffee vendor, um, individuals who would like to keep teach classes that's focused on social and emotional health and wellness and then uh, recovery resources as well, because I also started to have what we called a recovery spotlight, which we bring in those community-based resources into the cafe space for about an hour, and they talk about what resources are available and then can get those members directly connected to those resources uh, while they're there in the um, in the cafe, because we know in social service, you hand someone a piece of paper, does not mean they're going to get connected, right. but if I can connect you with a person, it increases your chance of uh, following through with the service because sure. now you've already started to build that relationship. So, so Camille, I, I, I'm going to ask this question. You don't have to answer, but mm -hmm. why aren't you there anymore? What 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 made you leave? Did you get a different job or something to that effect? Or is, um, I mean, I, what, ha what happened <laughs> when you left? Um, it, you, COVID cultural changes and then just, uh, um, I kind of took some time off because I went on my own spiritual kind of healing journey and needed to disconnect because as you can hear, the cafe became my whole entire life mm. and it started to become very unhealthy, you know, for me. But again, like I say, I'm still highly connected, um, to the cafe, to the motto. I, I help them out on a regular basis and you see, I talk about it. Yeah. All the time because it's well, something that's truly near and dear to my heart. So, so like many of us in this field, you know, no good yes. deed goes unpunished, and yes. and you know, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that um, yes. because you know that is something that we all need to remember. Yes, that we got to take care of ourselves here, because we're no good to anybody else. Yeah, and if, that's what if, I yeah. that's what I had to tell my members and my team is like I I can't tell you all to practice your self care and I can't tell you to uh, really follow your heart and align with your spirit if I'm not doing the same. So I have to be the example, you know, for the community here. And it was a hard decision, very very tough, but you know, so I it was the right one for you. So that's that's great. Where I'm at now and with my current position, I'm still able to be deeply connected to the cafe. So. It all works together. Yeah, it does. And, and you know, and unfortunately, in coalitions, all too often, I, I struggle this with a lot of organizations that I'm involved with. There is a key person that really drives the boat, and you know, is that energy person that really kind of keeps motivating people and that sort of thing. Well, our job as coalitions is to broaden that, so it's not as dependent. It's a little bit more decentralized because what happens when that person leaves? For whatever reason, uh, they win the lotto, they're gone, whatever. Maybe they'll throw some money. But, I mean, other than that, so it's really important. Um, and, you know, in some of the chat earlier was, you know, uh, mentoring, you know, the, 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 the folks that have been around for a little while, mentoring the young people. Those folks that have been around for 10 years, do each one of you have a, a formal mentoring? What are you doing to strengthen your coalition, what your community? Maybe it's not your specific coalition that you're running, but your community at large. Are you uh, are you mentoring a young person? Because if we're not deepening our bench, if we are not making the case for people to get into this field, they're all going to go work at Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or something else because they'll make more money. And and, and that is part of our responsibility of co uh, of 
coalition building of capacity building it is that those connections what you know camille was talking about in terms of building giving people an opportunity to kind of share their uh strengths hopes you know uh goals and that, that sort of is really important um and oftentimes we don't because we get so caught up in you know action plans and our our matrix of things uh to be done we need to make sure that we're including that because that is an essential part of capacity building and capacity building is also um you know culturally cultural responsiveness, making sure that, you know, we are diverse, uh, equitable, inclusive, and belonging. Sometimes, who you know, the question is, who belongs? Well, the, the, there's an ownership. Sometimes people take that ownership to, a, you know, uh, an nth degree, and it becomes theirs, and you want that ownership, but not at the sake of losing um, you know, this is mine and, and there's no opportunity for others. So some of this stuff is about building it and letting it go. And sometimes that's easier said than done, but something that we need to think about uh, as we go forward. Anybody else have any comments? Thank you so much, Camille. I appreciate that. And please check out the Re Recovery Cafe. Um, anybody else uh, have comments? Everybody monitoring the chat. I don't want to miss people. I'm kind of multitasking. No, no. Um, uh, they're giving lots of kudos to her for sharing that um, her her story, and they're inspired by what she shared. Amen. Amen. Yes, indeed. Very supportive community. Very good. That's great. That's great. And because sometimes prevention can be a very lonely place, um, where you know we talked about the unrealistic expectations before. And uh, sometimes, you know, we, we we put those on ourselves, or sometimes our community uh, expects unrealistic uh, expectations uh, for that. But uh, but we move forward. So you know, again, as we were talking about recruiting missing sectors. I mean, if you're missing youth, how do you get youth? Reaching out to them, inviting to them to one of your meetings is. Sure, that, that can that can work if you've got the, the right environment, but sometimes it's better for you to go to them um, where they're naturally, they're, you know, meeting and convening. Or perhaps hosting a special and, and compensating them or, in, you know, providing incentives to be part of it so that they can talk about their, their goals and dreams. That whole peer leadership uh, concept in, in the past. Or, you know, perhaps... You know, if you haven't done an assessment of your community, what what aspects of your community are missing these days I, from your coalition? You know, I work with a number of communities, especially in Rotary, you know, some affluent communities that say they don't have any diversity. <laughs> and once you start peeling back that onion, maybe the diversity is far more than just the color of a person's skin, correct? Um, you know, it's thoughts, it's, you know, all different aspects, uh, religion, backgrounds, abilities, all that sort of thing. Um, having that conversation could be uncomfortable sometimes in different situations, but oftentimes it, getting through that uncomfortability so that it becomes um, more commonplace to kind of talk about maybe our differences, maybe our barriers, or ways that we can lift one another up. Uh, it's the not talking about these kinds of things or not exploring um, different communities in our in our community, within our community, that that's where, you know, it's kind of benign neglect. Uh, we recognize, you know, XYZ community within our community is is underrepresented, but we can never get people to come to the meeting or we can never, you know, we don't have a good contact. That is very common. Uh, what are you doing to kind of build those bridges? Are you part of your Chamber of Commerce? Are you part of your Rotary Club? Are you part of uh, the NAACP? Are you part of uh, faith groups? Whatever the, the case might be, you've got to go to them. Uh, and that's got to be part of your capacity building activity. Um, and the better you could talk about your mission, the better you could, the more inclusive your, your mission and your elevator speeches the more likely people will listen. 
once they listen. And if you can find your champions within that community, then encourage that champion to, you know, to work with you. Because I, unfortunately, substance use, mental health, uh, behavioral health issues transcend all communities. Everybody's facing it. Some might feel like it impacts one disproportionately over another, but you know, to, to for a mother to lose their child doesn't matter if there's ten thousand. Is that one that's really the 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 most impact? And you know, and unfortunately, that's happening way too often in so many degrees. And so we need to kind of come together and be uh, better collaborators uh, as we go forward. Shared knowledge, um, you know, leadership assessment, creating leadership uh, pathways, helping people, educational programs, uh, a robust communication. Uh, you know, again, listservs are great. And, you know, the electronic, um, you know, notifications are great. And that needs to be one part. But there are multiple challenge, uh, uh, channels. Um, are you going to different groups and in, in, and speaking to them, are do you set goals to that uh, regard so that you can be uh, successful with it? These are the kinds of things that you need to be thinking about uh, as leaders of coalitions. So, want to kind of <coughs> on a if you could jot down and you know, this is for your own benefit, but you know identify for your work whether you're the leader of a coalition or leader of an agency or leader of or a participant in in a group, um, what, where do you want to focus your biggest attention? You need to identify that. You need to spend some time thinking about it uh, quietly with colleagues uh, and in very intentionally thinking about these different sectors. Um, <coughs> I wanted, you know, these are the, you know, the twelve areas that you know we all work on when we're part of these drug-free community. Um, coalitions. However, what I want to want you to think about and jot down in, on your own uh, work. If you're a preventionist, are there other preventionists in your community that you don't have a connection with? Why? And is there a way to kind of have a coffee and build a bridge? Um, harm reduction. Do we have many? I saw one or two um, harm reduction intervention kinds of folks that's that's oftentimes a you know prevention and harm reduction uh, although they're both trying to prevent something uh or prevent death anyway um you know sometimes there are disconnects anybody in the harm reduction field that would feel like they would like to get more support from one of the other parts of the continuum anybody want to chime in on that yeah, I would love to hear about that. Again, you can just raise your hand and Taylor will unmute you if you'd like to call off a mute or if you want to put something in the chat about that. Could you could you ask that question again or pose that thought again, Carl? Sure, sure, sure. Oh, it, and Carl, I'm sorry, we're at the we're at the fifteen minute mark, by the yes, way. Yes. Yes. So we are we've got fifteen minutes and we need a few minutes for evaluation, correct? Oh, just just uh like a couple two minutes. minutes or yeah, so. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, harm reductionists out there, folks that are doing street work, folks that are doing, um, you know, helping people doing that, that hands on stuff. What can the community do? What do you wish you had more support for? Somebody want to kind of throw something in the chat? I'm not seeing anything yet. Nothing yet. All right. Say. Oh, we have, I think, okay. You you raise your hand and, and just person, shout out. We have one person, Alexis, who's raised their hand. Go ahead, Alexis. We want to hear from Alexis. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I actually work for a nonprofit that is prevention based, but we also have a subsidiary nonprofit that is harm reduction based. Mm. Um, so we have the dual aspects in how, how do you guys work together is, are you guys close or is it is there a, a line between both there is a line but we overlap a lot of the times um it's, it's, how do you overlap 
Um, so we will show up at the same events and like community outreach and things like that. Um, and like our partners and the organizations and agencies that we all partner with in these communities. Um, they know, you know, they know us as the prevention side, and then they also know our harm reduction side. Um, so it's really a, a quick question. I, we're going to continue with this conversation. When you guys show up to the, the these uh, outreach events, do you have two separate tables or is it one table? We do two separate tables um, because okay. we're looking at pretty much, we're looking at different populations that we serve. Um, and so we do try to keep a little bit of separation so that way partners and individuals in the community can know the difference, um, but knowing that they can reach out to one or the other and they can get the help that they need right off. Gotcha. Good. All right. I, I'm always interested in, in, in hearing about that. Are there any conflicts in terms of the work that you do? Um, no, not really any conflicts with the work that we do. It's just about the funding. That's why we have to have two uh, separate um, the funding. Yeah. So our prevention is basically block grant is our majority of our funding and so we have to stay really diligent about staying with primary prevention while harm reduction is able to provide like that tertiary prevention and they're they're able to kind of you know act, help people access to resources and wound care and hiv testing and all the things that we aren't able to do even though it is a preventative tactic of spreading anything that could harm someone else in the community. Right. Um, and I, you know, and I want to be respectful for funders and that kind of stuff. I don't mean to, to, to minimize that. However, what about the person that's in active use that has a kid at home? So, um, for active use, active use, that would be strictly probably with our harm reduction team. Um, those with children at home, I'm going to be honest, we don't see as many with two parents that have active addiction. Um, but when they go into that sort of thing, if, you know, if we see um, the primary prevention side, we're mandatory reporters. Um, so we do, you know, if we see harm or suspected sure. abuse and things like that, we do have to report that. Um, but. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm just asking the question just to challenge us to kind of look beyond and say, because we know that a, a child growing up in a, a home of active use is far more uh, likely to become active users themselves, you know, just from adverse childhood experiences. Yes. Um, so, you know, th that, it, it, you know, have the prevention team ever gone on an outreach with the Harm reduction team, and individuals, just to kind of do a shift, just to check it out, and like a training kind of thing, just sit in the background. Yeah, um, so we have had a few prevention folks who go with their harm reduction team, especially in bigger areas, um, like the, where we service the Charlotte Mecklenburg area, um, and so that is our most popular, like our largest program that we have mm -hmm. so far. Um, in the rural areas, we do not attend with them because it's all about them building that trust and that relationship. So sure. tagging on a secondary person, a lot of people don't seem to enjoy that because they've had the same person that they've been Yeah, yeah, right, right, especially if their relationships have been built. One of the things that we've done um, locally is we've done post overdose outreach and we have a law enforcement faith member and recovery coach person um you know attend and you'd be surprised i'm, I'm not talking about as established relationships but you know we, we respond to every um overdose that we're aware of um just to kind of offer support and that sort of thing and you'd be surprised who you know the, out of the three it's 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 who you know um and i think we put I guess my, my point being is with all of this stuff, um, be thoughtful, be intentional in terms of what you do, but look beyond just what, you know, you know your category, your prevention, your arm reduction, your silo. recovery, your silo, uh, and, and begin to understand because, you know, there is a lot of opportunity for better understanding and better relationships 
if we could cross over. You know, recovery folks, you know, helping out with harm reduction, it puts people at risk. So it's very difficult. However, uh, folks in recovery also understand, you know, could be a, it be an asset. So you got to do things in safety. You got to be smart. It's not just you know uh, a random and that sort of thing. But with you know, challenge yourself to kind of cross over a little bit. I mean, I know we talked about the 12, you know, the government and churches and all that, but if we're going to strengthen our continuum of care as providers of, of care for uh, substance use disorder, mental health, uh, behavioral health kinds of issues, we need to be able to be more um, connected as a continuum uh, because there's a lot of value here. And I think we miss it because we're, we're stuck in, in, um, things and it, it's not for everybody i'm not saying everybody should just jump in i'm just saying think about it think about what one thing that you can do maybe it's not harm reduction maybe it's treatment maybe I do, you know do the prevention folks know treatment people or how how are um you know <clears throat> are there groups in your local treatment center that you know how does a parent talk to their children about uh, about drugs i mean that's a nice connection between prevention and treatment that i don't think is too often um, done. The recovery community and prevention, a lot of times, you know, telling the story, you got to do it. You don't want to glorify, but, you know, you know, sometimes hearing it from somebody that's lived it is, is an important, important piece. Hearing that recovery is possible from somebody that's lived a life of recovery is powerful. So, I mean, the, the point of all of this is to you know, it might not be revolutionary information, but if you take more time to think about these areas and how we can interconnect uh, more effectively as a continuum, the better our communities and the better our outcomes will be. Uh, because there are, as was was mentioned, um, there are, there's a lot of overlap and, yeah. uh, you know, con connect. So. Yes. Uh, that is, I mean, I think stressing that word continuum is such so vital to this conversation. And Alexis talked about how peer support is such an asset. I think that it's a it's a beautiful place for if if you're willing for us to open it up to see if anyone has any questions that they'd like to uh, come off of mute, or if you'd like to put a question in the chat or a closing comment. We have about five minutes remaining. And we've had so much conversation going on in the chat and a lot of people talking about, uh, I imagine in prevention, working around harm reduction and the challenges of a political climate, which makes me immediately think of educating your decision makers, not necessarily advocating, but just educating them on the power of the continuum, um, trying to reduce that stigma. Yes. Um, do we have any questions in the chat that anyone would like to pose to Carl or to our entire network here that's on? Or any challenges? You know, yeah. I, again, you know, I, I, I'm glad that the political issue brought, you know, for the first time, uh, we were, it was uh, uh, Overdose Awareness Day. And I was able to introduce my local representative who was a person in recovery and he comes out and, 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 and talks about it freely and openly. Um, and that was powerful. It was a, obviously a group of mostly folks that have been touched by addiction, but uh, he, he is open as a community. That's how we break down the stigma is by mm -hmm. celebrating that. And that, Hey, you know, this is where it's at. Um, you know, people will, talk about being cancer survivors or or overcoming other kinds of things we should be celebrating those that are overcoming uh addiction as well i really yeah. appreciate your time yes we do have um a hand raise so oh so let it first, rip yeah i'm gonna unmute you Carl, oh, you can stop sharing your slides if you'd like so everyone oh, can yeah sorry about that yeah, yeah. sorry yeah sorry And you can set it in the grid layout, everybody, if you'd like, or whatever kind of layout you want. Chris, are you able to? Or because of the political political climate, we're limited on what we can say. I can't talk about needle exchanges. I can only talk about harm reduction. And there are certain key phrases that we cannot engage in. And so that political climate is really, it, it makes it a real challenge to build these coalitions and to 
make the changes you want to see happen happen because you're being hampered by really high level constraints. I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, but that's the landscape. <laughs> so yes, you're right. We have the same kind of problem. We don't have um, uh, needle exchange in our city, but we have them in all of the surrounding towns. So somebody can't, you know, uh, replace their, um, you know, you know, their needles in the city, but they can go over to the next town and do it. I mean, there are workarounds. It's unfortunate, um, and you know, safe injection sites. That was one of the things that people um, really kind of on talk radio really blew up. Oh, we're going to have all these people shooting up and all that kind of stuff. Well, I hate to tell you, they're already doing it. Uh, but it, it's, you know, how do we make it safer? How do we, you know, it's happening throughout the entire community uh, and that. So, I mean, your point is well taken, but hey, there's an election coming up on the 8th. Um, you know, it's important that communication strategy is to celebrate the stuff that's working well, um, you know, uh, and continue to talk about facts, continue to, to have the conversation, not, you know, j just to uh, be heard, but also to be understood, uh, because that will require relationship. How about we're the champions in your community who have been touched by addiction? Uh, how do you work with them so that they have the courage and the and wherewithal to kind of make those kinds of comments? There's lots of things that can be done. It might not be as easy uh, as just being able to you know, open up a program. Um, but, you know, again, as preventionists, as anybody in our continuum, it's our responsibility to advance this. Um, and so, you know, here's some of the things. Thank you for that, Bill. I appreciate it. Anybody else? If you could, it would really uh, be helpful uh, just to follow the QR code and uh, take a couple minutes to um, fill out the uh, evaluation. Uh, if you yes. could do that, I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. And thank you everyone for your, your engagement, um, for your participation. And you all have been a, a wonderful crowd. 